where there's a, a legitimate uh, professional note or note from an elder, why not just approve requests below $500 and you still save $38 each request, right? So those are the kinds of solutions we're putting forward. Next slide. So um, you that's just another kind of uh, 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 slide, uh, just kind of going through the uh, non-compliance. But at the bottom, you're going to see one of the things the Caring Society feels strongly about is we don't just sit back and criticize Canada. Where we see non-compliance, we report it immediately and we're proactive in suggesting solutions. We say to Canada, look, you don't have to adopt our solution, but you do have to solve the problem. Children can't be left uh, suffering under the discrimination because you don't want to take up our solution and don't have a better alternative. Next slide. Another thing I just want to flag about compensation is that this is going to be a significant impact for communities. And in many ways, it will be positive, but we all are realistic on this call that for vulnerable persons, it is going to be a complication. Oh, fi what is a fi final settlement agreement, Rosie? Thank you. It's a, it's a negotiated settlement between the parties to resolve the discrimination and prevent it from happening again. But even that final settlement agreement would need to be approved by the tribunal and by chiefs of assembly. So thanks for your question. Um, so all of this money from this class action is going to come in, not just from the one for the $23.4 billion, but we've been hearing from community members. There's another one for water. There's other settlements. And all of this is going to impact community members. Um, and uh, in the final settlement agreement on the uh, case, in our case, uh, it includes uh, some provisions for mental wellness and cultural supports, uh, but it does not include surge capacity for other types of services. For example, maybe you're running a youth center, maybe you're an addictions uh, worker, maybe you are working in a women's shelter. Um, all of those the services are likely going to be taxed, and there's no clear plan that I'm aware of right now on how to support you in meeting the additional need. And it's pretty clear that all of you are working really hard at the nation level, and it's going to be hard to take on additional uh, additional work uh, resulting from these class action compensation deals. So we are anticipating more demands for Jordan's principle during this time. And that's another reason why uh, ensuring Canada is complying right now is, is, is a priority for us. Next slide. So uh, just to reiterate, we don't file non-compliance motions without having done everything that we can reasonably think of to be able to get them to comply. And so we did all this and more. And if you read the uh, affidavits that Brittany and I filed, you're going to see not only have we been trying, but in letters we've received from First Nations, from First Nations coordinators, tribal councils and others, they've been trying to get Canada to comply. And they've been struggling as well. And as a result, they've been seeing kids suffer. And in many, many cases, we're seeing communities stepping up to the plate and paying for the service themselves and waiting to be reimbursed. And I know that we've done that here at the Caring Society. And you can do that for a period of time. But now we're finding First Nations are running into serious deficits in other programs. So it's not sustainable. Next slide. So uh, we filed the non-compliance motion on December 12th. And then uh, we filed the affidavits, Brittany and I, on uh, January 12th. All of this is on our website, fnwitness.ca. I'm gonna ask Brittany to put in the link in the chat. And uh, you might be asking what the next steps are, and David and Kevin will help us with this. Uh, there's a tribunal case conference, and they will set down dates for Canada's response to our affidavits and motion. Uh, the Assembly of First Nations, a Chiefs of Ontario, Anishinaabe Aski Nation, and the Canadian Human Rights Commission and Amnesty International will have to say on that date what role they wish to take, if any, in the ongoing proceedings. And the tribunal's given an early indication that it wants to hear this in April and May. This will be a public hearing. Uh, we'll uh, do our best to make sure it's televised so you can watch it from wherever you are and and here I always do a shout out to our colleagues at Aboriginal People's Television Network who uh, have, have taped the main trial and many of the subsequent hearings to make sure they're available to First Nations folks across the country. Next slide. 
So um, all of this filing of this non-compliance motion uh, has led to something else. And that is that the agreement in principle uh, ha had a stipulation that you couldn't file non-compliance motions if you were in there. But ethically, the Caring Society felt like children are suffering from discrimination. We cannot, we've tried everything we can to get Canada to comply. We can't morally stay in a process that's meant to end discrimination and at the same time provide Canada a shield to being accountable to that discrimination. So we made the difficult decision to leave the agreement and principle process. That means that we're not uh, in the same category as the other parties in negotiating a final settlement agreement. We, uh, it doesn't mean we're leaving the table and I wanna make this really clear. We're a co-complainant in this case and we take our obligation seriously to end the discrimination in Jordan's principle and child and family. It just means we'll be taking a different approach. And one of the things that we feel strongly is being accountable to everyone. So we will be uh, publishing very uh, shortly a public negotiation protocol for the Caring Society. So you know what we're paying attention to. Uh, and uh, one of our key things is transparency. We realize these are your children and your nations, and we need to be accountable to you. And we are going to make public uh, our position so that you can see them, test them. See if you have a better idea to suggest to us because we really want to do this right for kids. Next slide. A uh, quick word about liability and then I'm going to turn it over to David and to Kevin. Uh, I just all these caveats. I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an insurance broker. My key message is if you're providing Jordan's principal services, you need to talk to a lawyer specialized in what they call tort law. Uh, and you also need to talk to your insurance broker. Next slide. So uh, the National Advisory Committee, NAC, they're called, uh, First Nations Child and Family Services, which Mary TG is a member of uh, for BC. Uh, we've done some work on uh, liability. And generally, uh, you're at higher liability exposure, uh, the higher the risk is for the, um, for the activity you're trying to do. The more vulnerable the group, children, and the higher the duty of care you have to those children. So if you think about providing Jordan's principal services at a Jordan's at a community level, you could check all those boxes of high risk. Next slide. So who needs coverage? Um, it's not only your navigators, coordinators, it could be First Nations employees, it could be the First Nations government itself. It can be elders and knowledge keepers who are providing services to kids. Uh, it can be foster parents or respite providers. It can be uh, a whole list of people who are agents acting as contractors or are receiving honoraria from Jordan's principal to deliver services. So these, you will know your list as well, but I just wanted to put out some examples. Next slide. And uh, we did an initial, we had an initial opinion provided uh, from experts on uh, liability. And the bottom line is that if you're approving or denying requests for Jordan's principal, or if Canada gave you a pool of funds to dispense, you're at higher risk for liability. And so you want to make sure you're reaching out to your experts in law, as well as your insurance broker, to make sure you're covered and that everyone in your circle is covered. Um, if you make a bad faith decision, uh, that is not going to be covered by anybody. So I think we all know that around this call. And uh, the more, the more uh, kind of policies and procedures you have in place to make sure that you're making those decisions in alignment with uh, objective criteria, the better. So I just want to just highlight this for you because Canada has a tendency of wanting to offload liability onto First Nations, and we don't want to see that happen. Next slide. So that's all I have to say. And uh, I'm just going to do uh, invite uh, David Taylor and Kevin Droz to say a few remarks, and then we'll open it up for some questions. So David and Kevin. Uh, th thanks very much, Cindy. So uh, David Taylor, and I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Kevin Dro. Uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, kind of at a high level about what's coming next with the Caring Society's non-compliance motion at the, at the tribunal. 
Uh, and that's, of course, you know, something that has been uh, ongoing for many years since the Caring Society and the Assembly of First Nations first filed the complaint back in uh, in 2007. And so this this process is one that we've been following since the tribunal's decision uh, almost uh, eight years ago, finding discrimination within the Child and Family Service Program and regarding Jordan's principal. And so it's when there are concerns about the government's conduct under the existing orders, which are very broadly to end the discrimination and stop it from recurring, uh, the parties can bring that to the tribunal and uh, and have the tribunal make a decision on it. Uh, and so, uh, as as Cindy noted, you know there will be ways to access that further on down the road. The Human Rights Tribunal is hearing things mainly by Zoom now, and so we will be addressing with them uh, ways for the public to access that, whether it be attending a a Zoom webinar like this, or uh, you know, a live stream of the uh, of, or web stream of the Zoom hearing, as has been done for other uh, other hearings in this case <clears throat> over the last few years. So, with that kind of brief introduction, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, to Kevin. Thanks very much, David. Uh, so, as David mentioned, and as Dr. Blackstock previewed, I'll be touching on what's happening next for the non-compliance motion. I'll begin just with some very brief context points, and then turn to next steps and try to wrap things up in three or four minutes or so. Uh, so the context piece, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal provided directions to the Caring Society and the other parties to the complaint on the 21st of December. The tribunal indicated that they'd considered the Caring Society's request for a tight schedule on the non-compliance motion filed in December. And what's really important is that they said that they intend to hear the motion expeditiously, given the nature of the issues that the Caring Society raised in terms of Canada's non-compliance adjournance principle. What they directed was that the Caring Society was to file its evidence by the 12th of January. We did that last week on Friday by submitting Dr. Blackstock's affidavit and Brittany's affidavit and supporting evidence totaling over a thousand pages. So turning now to the next steps, uh, the tribunal directed the parties to review our evidence and to obtain instructions about the response to the evidence by no later than the 22nd of January. Uh, that's Monday next week. And the point here is that by Monday, the parties need to be in position to speak to the tribunal about the Caring Society's motion and evidence and about their intended next steps. On the 23rd of January, which is Tuesday next week, there's going to be a case conference before the tribunal. The parties will indicate what their instructions are and they'll indicate how they will respond to our motion, how much time they'll need to respond to the motion, uh, whether they'll support the motion or whether they may take a different position. At or after the case conference, the tribunal will set a schedule for the motion and dates by which certain things have to happen. Uh, in particular, the tribunal will decide first when the other parties have to submit their own affidavits and evidence on the motion. For example, uh, Canada will have to file evidence that responds to us and the tribunal will decide when it has to do so. Second, the tribunal will decide when cross-examinations on each party's affidavit will take place. This will involve parties being able to question another party's affiant, which is the person who affirmed uh, that party's affidavit and evidence. Uh, and as Dr. Blackstock indicated for the Caring Society, those persons were Dr. Blackstock and Brittany. It's possible that the cross-examinations will occur in February, but again, that's gonna be up to the tribunal. Uh, Cross-examinations will likely take place by Zoom, however, with the tribunal members attending, and that's so that they can ask questions while the cross-examinations are taking place. The third thing is that the tribunal will decide when the parties will submit their written legal arguments to the tribunal. It's possible that this will happen in March or April, but once again, that's going to be up to the tribunal. And then fourth and lastly, the tribunal is going to decide when it will actually hear the Caring Society's motion. So the tribunal has indicated that it's prepared to hear the motion in April or May, and this is consistent with its indication that it's prepared to hear the motion expeditiously. Uh, so just as a, a quick recap, next week we should know the other party's positions on the Caring Society's motion. Next week we're likely to have a schedule set by the tribunal, and next week we're likely to know whether we'll be proceeding to a hearing in April or May, if that's still possible. Thanks very much, and back to you, Dave. Well, and I'll actually pass it back over uh, to uh, to Cindy and Brittany. I've always a, been a strong uh, favor of the proponent in spaces like this that lawyers are best seen and not heard, uh, unless people have questions. So uh, we'll leave it. Uh, we'll leave it at that. 